we are. We are back. back. The episode that you never thought was coming your way. For two years. You've been waiting. For two years, Evan's been telling you, I promise it's coming. I promise it's coming. I I'm going to I'm gonna do the research. I promise it's coming. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Did you want to do the research? Because I've been busting my ass off. I read two books on this. You don't this, got much of an ass to bust th- off. Bitch, I have an ass. <laughs> and you know what I do. I'm lucky. Because this is going to drop right after our two-year anniversary, official two-year anniversary, which is June thirteenth. Oh, well, there you go. This Look is, at that. This is dropped after, but um, yeah, two years. We said we're going to cover the AIDS crisis, but wanted to do it right, and so it was right. And I read the longest book in the fucking history, not in history, but it's a fucking long book, almost as long as the Bible. I'm pretty Look sure. Look at the the print. The the print on this is as the <laughs> the band plays on and and they don't even he doesn't even give you the decency of ending it early because a lot of times books will start with like a prologue that you don't mm-hmm. need and then or and, and then they'll do an epilogue that you don't need and and like all these resources in the back but no no that's like it's six all point book. Funk. Like when you had to write a paper in school and they said oh, you have to do at least 12 font. Yeah, exactly. This is like eight font. This and is, it's. Yeah. And it's 625 pages in eight font. And so. You did a good job though. I'll give you that. I did. And I also read, well, listened to um, another book called Patient Zero. But anyways, that wasn't. But yeah, we'll get to all that. So. Um, how's your Pride Month going? It's a uh, it's a uh, a unique Pride Month. It's a really unique Pride Month. Um, at this point, haven't done too much. <laughs> Honestly, Can't do too much. But um, yeah, working on getting things done. Um, hang on a second. Let me see something. Just checking dates. No. Um, yeah. So the seventeenth, halfway through the month. Yeah. Not much done. Um, when when's your party? <laughs> um, I don't know because the house that we, um, my, our party's coming, this supposed to come that weekend, but the house that we're supposed to use had a uh, problem, and so they had to like have all these renovations done, so they don't know now if we're going to be able to host the party there. Oh. But if not, we're going to host the party here. So You're whispering. <laughs> well, because I didn't know we were, I thought you were asking me off off microphone. Well, I, I don't know. It doesn't matter okay. either way. Um, so we are having a party coming up. Party at Evan's house. Um, <laughs> we are inviting still, everyone on the podcast. No nope, restrictions are still in place in Rhode <laughs> Island, so not party that we can have. Um, hopefully by now they've lifted a little bit. It's 15 people, and hopefully it's lifted to like 30, but whatever. <laughs> like, I have more than 15 friends. Right. <laughs> well, if Samantha invites most of the people. Yeah, right. Samantha invites someone. We're going to have half of Rhode Island here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I decided to go see my family in the middle of Pride Month. It's the first time in six years that I've seen my blood family um, for my birthday, um, which I made the mistake of saying to my mother-in-law, it's the first time in six years since I've seen my family on my birthday. And she goes, oh, so what? We're not your family? Oh, Lord. So that Look was like did. a Samantha fight that I had with my mother-in-law. Mm-hmm. Um, so my blood family, and I'm only seeing like my sister and my brother-in-law. So Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, mm-hmm. so that's been my pride month. Mm. David signed up to do some um, online prides. Yeah, um, yeah, a lot of virtual prides. Virtual prides, yeah, but really, I mean, other than just like podcast stuff, been pretty chill. There hasn't been many things, at least that I've seen around happening. Yeah. I know bars are, are allowed to reopen and things, so yeah, probably went to a few of those since yeah. we were recording in the past. <laughs> yeah, a lot of impromptu things, smaller parties, more like the pride of the early days. Yeah, not you know? the huge... Uh, statewide or citywide marches and things yeah. like that. Yeah, my march was the Black Lives Matter march. Mm-hmm. So you know that's what that's what it was really about in the old days. But in during the days of the AIDS crisis, people marched. They didn't party and celebrate. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Um. Make sure you check out our merch shop. So I know we are halfway through Pride Month, but. We still have Pride merch that you can wear all year long. We have everything from stickers that go on sale for as low as $1.50 to $13 t-shirts to mugs. Um, I tried to cover as many groups of people in the LGBT community that I could. There's things for pansexual, bisexual, 
um, gay, transgender, ally, um, a lot more that I can't yeah. remember off the top of my head, but I did try my best to cover everything. Yeah. Um, and make sure wherever you're listening, you follow, like, subscribe, review, and download. If you cannot review on the platform you're listening on, such as Spotify, feel free to give us a nice little tweet or re- review on iTunes or Stitcher. Yeah. And we'll mention this at the end of the episode, but the last two weeks of June, we're doing a push to get people to share our podcast, partly for Pride Month and partly to celebrate our two years of doing the podcast. So it's a very simple way to help us. I mean, if you want to subscribe and become a Patreon, you can. Um, if you share the link to your favorite episode on your Facebook and one person listens to that, mm-hmm. that's another listener. If yeah. you multiply that by 300 people doing that, that's 300 new listeners. Yeah. And all it takes is simple share. Yeah. So literally just sharing and telling people I love this podcast, sharing your favorite episode, anything like that helps us. And um, you're supporting queer businesses in Pride Month. So yeah, we appreciate it. We got a lot to cover today, so we're going to have to get into it. All right. You want to start today? <laughs> so, uh, then- I will. I'm going to tr- do my best to get through this. I'm, I'm okay. I think I can do this. Do you need a little good music to get you going? No, I don't mean like that. I just mean that like this was very the roughest thing I have studied. And I'm by Even far. Even worse than the true crime murder episodes? Oh, yeah. Because it was just, it's all very depressing and overwhelming and frustrating. And I probably cried like 10 times. Wow. And I don't cry that much. I mean, it didn't help that I was doing my research right in the middle of everything that was happening with Black Lives Matter and the protests. And um, after I would get done watching a video of the police beating the shit out of a person, then I would read about, you know, thousands of men dying and nobody caring. So not great for my mental health. Did you have a virtual <laughs> therapy appointment? Um, no, but I did have some support groups. Oh, well, at least so, you had that. Yeah. But we're made, we made it, folks. We made it. And so mm. <laughs> and so here we are. We just got to get through recording them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So today we present the first half of our two-part series on the 1980s AIDS crisis and the way the epidemic unfolded in America during the first five years it was uncovered. There are few moments in history that have been darker for our community than the decade between 1980 and 1990. Almost every single LGBTQ plus person connected to the queer world watched someone they love die of the disease, and most people watched countless of their siblings suffer. As if the horror of the disease itself was not enough, the way the crisis was portrayed to the world only stoked the fires of homophobia and created a bias that blocked medical help and prevented research funding. Before we continue, we want to add a trigger warning and even encourage you to return to this episode later if you are not in a good mental health state. We are continuing on with our coverage of the AIDS crisis as it was long overdue and we want to remind everyone of not only why we celebrate, but why we march. We want to remind others of why we rally um, and protest and riot and fight to be heard and seen. As important as it is to dance and parade down the streets, it is equally important to remember where we came from and to acknowledge the work we still have to do. In many respects, 2020 Pride much more resembles the early Pride years and not the celebrations we have taken for granted. But yeah, but if you want to come back and listen to this later, this episode will always be here. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm very proud of it, did a lot of good work on it, but if you're also like, I can't listen to anything more depressing. You know, listen to our... uh, Listen to Lady Gaga's Chromatica. Okay, I was going to suggest something that we've produced, but sure, fine. Give Lady Gaga some more publicity. (laughs) You could listen to our I'm Not Gay, You're Gay episodes. That always makes me feel better. Also, one of my favorites, um, the Bible one, Mm -hmm. David and Jonathan. Is David and Jonathan's the best. Still the best one we've done. Yeah, Mm, Some great improv, some skits. Yeah. All thrown into an episode. Why can't we get back to that, Paul? Why don't we do... Because we do depressing things now. <laughs> <laughs> We're too serious and grown up now. Back then, we didn't give a shit what we said. Yep. It's true, though. <laughs> back then, we thought, we're like, this is never going to be anything. We'll say whatever the fuck we want. All right. Mm -hmm. As the last piece of business, we would like to acknowledge three of our main sources up front. The most influential reference of our research was the 1987 and the band played on by gay journalist Randy Schiltz, the book. Schiltz lived and reported throughout the AIDS epidemic, and his book is widely credited for helping to turn the tide of silence around the disease in the 1980s. It is emotional and raw in some parts, yet equally thorough and pragmatic in others. 
most importantly, and the band played on, expresses the anger and outrage of those who watched the epidemic unfold and yet saw that no one would listen. And no one knew this better than Schiltz, who lived in the queer community and was the only journalist in the entire nation to report on the epidemic full time. On the day Schultz submitted his final draft of the book, he was officially diagnosed with HIV and would die of AIDS seven years later on February 17, 1994. The book itself would go on to become a bestseller and later turned into the widely popular HBO movie created under the same title. However, despite its monumental achievements and lasting legacy, the book was written in the height of the crisis. Therefore, it did not have the benefit of hindsight nor the gift of time which allows for better understanding and perspective. Because of this, Schultz inadvertently created the myth of patient zero, which not only affected people's perception of the AIDS epidemic and the gay community, but also has affected the way we have viewed and classified disease outbreaks ever since. A hunt for the outbreak patient or patient zero creates a misconception of how illness actually travels and infects a group of people. There are other claims made in Schultz's book that reflected the science and medicine of the time, but that sense has been disproved. Um, a response... A response to these issues was published exactly 30 years later and is the second made main oh and is the second main reference for our research patient zero and the making of the aids epidemic by richard a mckay is used as our backup source on much of this information and you can actually see the patient myth uh, zero myth right now mm -hmm. there was like yeah. um this group of people who randomly selected this one woman on social media and they were like she's the cause of uh coronavirus yeah, they were like, "This is the woman who did it." They people were like sending her death threats and all kinds of crazy things. Yeah, and I'm like, one person didn't fucking couldn't cause coronavirus in the world. Like that's what. Yeah, well, and we're gonna talk a lot about, more about it on the second half. That's when we get to it. But it's, mm -hmm. uh, but it is incredible, and in it goes back into a long history of people like typhoid Mary. Mm -hmm was a, a, a thought where people decide they have to find the source of a disease, which is impossible, and they've got to blame that, as if by blaming that person. It'll make it better. Right, exactly, and it's not going to. And it's so, um, I don't know, it's eerie how we were supposed to cover the AIDS crisis last year, and we just never did because it just couldn't so devote the time. And now, in the middle of the coronavirus, we're covering this, and you're going to see so many Similarities down to the people that handled it. Dr. Anthony Fauci, who runs like the federal oversight of the coronavirus, was the man was was working in the AIDS um, crisis. He was one of the uh, main doctors in there. That's actually how he got his name. That's how he became an up and coming doctor, and that's how he ended up being like one of our uh, top national uh, health officials. So it's really crazy, you know, forty years later that. There's so many similarities, mm -hmm. so many. Um, but yeah, but also I want to say, and I really do um, respect Randy Schultz's book. I do a lot, but I do also think like if you're you're writing it, like there's a difference in perspective when you're living in it. Right, and, and then you have the man. actual medical research of decades of understanding. So exactly. it clearly gives you a different perspective and you're like, okay, this didn't happen. This is what happened. But, you know, you, yeah. can, you can see better. You can appreciate both of them. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> finally, our third major reference, and, and I, it's a main reference, but it's not as much as the others, um, is the, is used mostly in the second half of our two part series left behind black America, a neglected priority in the global AIDS epidemic is a 56 page book published by the black AIDS Institute in 2008. And if you want to know more about the black AIDS Institute, you can listen to our, um, is it a uh, black HIV and AIDS awareness episode? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it addresses the silence that has continued to surround the black community in regards to the AIDS crisis compounded by racism, homophobia, and AIDS stigma. We would also suggest the book, The Secret Epidemic, The Story of AIDS in Black America by Jacob Levinson. Unfortunately, we did not have enough access to the book to put it as one of our main sources. And now, with our main references credited... Let us begin the darkest tale in modern queer history. <clears throat> AIDS, the bold single word title, took up half of the front cover of the August 1985 Newsweek magazine. Underneath was, underneath was a picture of dying actor Rock Hudson and the script that read, It's the nation's worst public health problem. No one has ever recovered from the disease, and the number of cases is doubling every year. Now fears are growing that the AIDS epidemic may spread beyond gays and other high-risk groups to threaten the population at large. 
Reading that cover, one would assume this was the first time anyone had been warned about AIDS. That this was a new virus and the public was being alerted to the discovery. But in truth, America was years into the epidemic with doctors warning of the disease as early as 1979 and the CDC being notified in 1981. By the time this cover was printed, rec- recorded numbers at the CDC showed 12,067 people diagnosed and half of those, 6,079, had already died of AIDS. But what is more horrifying is the fact that due to understaffing, bigotry, and pure apathy, those numbers were grossly undercalculated. By the end of 1987, just two years later, 50,280 people would be diagnosed with AIDS, and 47,993 of those would be counted as dead. That's like a um, 99% death rate. Yeah. Can and you- I, the fear that just must have, the fear of that community of the past, I can't even imagine. I, and I think the thing is that like it really snuck up on people like they heard about it mm-hmm. for years and I was actually um, I talked to my friend um, uh, uh, Brody I always give Brody's name uh, it's Levesque um, Brody Levesque and uh, Brody is a journalist and he lived during that time and he talked about like you heard about it you knew about AIDS for mm-hmm. years but you just didn't understand the thing about AIDS and HIV is that it lays dormant for so many years so there, you started to see this slow trickle of people dying, but just like folks believe that they can't get the coronavirus, mm-hmm. people just believed, oh, I'm not going to get AIDS. It's not going to be me. Right. And then all of a sudden it took off and people were just dropping dead left and yeah, right. Yeah, because if it's dormant for years, nobody thinks they had it. Everybody's just spreading it. Exactly. Then the years go on and all of a sudden all the people who had it these years ago were just dropping. Exactly. And then in, in one, like you went from like, I don't know anyone that has AIDS to I know a hundred people that have AIDS and you know, 97 of them are dead Yep. and there's nothing that you can do. Like it's, yeah. And it, nobody's even addressing it. It's just like, exactly. that's the gay disease. That's what you get. Yeah. That's exactly it. Um, actually when I first came out, I remember my mom, my mom crying one day because one of her friends told her, well, Paul's gay. But if you're a part of the gay community, it's not, if you're going to get AIDS, it's just, a, it's just when, and that's mm. just like the kind of stigma that, it still exists. Still lingers. Yeah. And we're going to talk so much about it. Um, and it's, again, the second half is is really good. Like, this half is good, but it's really laying the foundation mm-hmm. because this is the first three years. And you just you just see the frustration. You're like, shit, it's coming. Shit, it's coming. And then in the next half, we really talk about Everything it. Everything like, just fucking shit. It just erupts. Fan, yeah. Yeah. And, but, yeah, it's that same thing. Like, I mean, like, so clear that this is not a gay disease. And here we are. 40 years later yeah 20 20 50 years later and people still believe yeah it's a gay disease the origins of aids will never fully be known as is the case with any virus yet there's a solid theory in place in 1999 researchers discovered a strain of hiv1 and subspecies of chimpanzees the red capped mangabe mangabes and greater spot-nosed monkeys while these smaller monkeys were immune to the disease their chimp and human cousins are not so lucky the spread of the virus came first through the natural food chain. The larger chimpanzees, the larger chimpanzees ate the smaller monkeys, becoming infected with the disease. And later, human hunters ate the infected chimpanzees. The confirmation would not come until the 90s, until the late 90s. Bias and racism against Africans as the so-called creators of AIDS has continued to play out over the last 40 years, much the same way the Chinese are somehow blamed for coronavirus and depicted as rabid, bad-eating monsters who deliberately spread the, the illness. Right, some mm-hmm. things just don't change. It's the same thing. <laughs> just gotta blame. Like it just, it's disease, people. Like that's just part of being a human on Earth. There's going to be disease. There's not it's creators. Literally it's literally been happening. Well, the only time it's creators is when the United States actually infects when, their own cities. But yeah, like the Tuskegee, the Tuskegee. You notice how the United States did that, not another country. Mm-hmm. Anyways, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's no like disease. Just fucking happens viruses mutate viruses i don't know how it works i just know that they fucking come out and they spread to people yeah it's yeah. not like somebody was like i don't know doing some crazy in um 
barbaric act that no. all of a sudden create a disease that's killing the world. That's not right. how it works. And then, and again, also in diseases like this where they lay dormant for so long, people have it for 10 years and mm-hmm. pass it on to so many others and don't even know that it exists. I mean, in a second, I'm going to say, like, we have the earliest recordings is 1920, but you don't see rapid expansion until the 1980s. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's just this thing. Like, we just have to hate. and, and But like, like you said, disease happened. And I did read a lot about how disease or originated and then didn't put it in here because <laughs> I couldn't stay awake through it. So I didn't think anyone else could. There you go. Many researchers, many researchers have proposed that AIDS originated around 1920, but the earliest blood sample of AIDS in a human is from 1959. The sample came from a resident in Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo. From there, the disease spread across the continent and later into the Caribbean, no doubt through ocean trade routes and the sex industry. In the 1960s, AIDS began to hit the country of Haiti when several officials who had been in the Congo returned home. By 1970, the disease had lodged in New York City, one of the largest international travel stops in the world. Over the next decade, AIDS would slowly cross the continent, taking residents in several large cities and particularly in America's gay districts. In order to understand how the epidemic unfolded in America, one must understand what the queer world looked like in the late 70s. After the Stonewall riots of 1969, a revolution swept the country like never before with annual marches and parades. The DSM removed homosexuality as a mental disorder in 1973, a few large corporations began to show support for gay and lesbian employees, and many local laws in large cities banned discrimination. 28 states and provinces of America repealed their sodomy laws between 1970 and 1980. Though three states reinstated the sodomy bans a year later, which were Arkansas, Idaho, and Utah, and a few made stipulations that the bans were only lifted for heterosexuals and not homosexuals. (laughs) <laughs> which that's wonderful yeah well you straight people as long as it's going in a, a females behind <laughs> exactly it's okay we don't have a problem with assholes we have a problem with men's assholes mm-hmm. that's it still no one could deny that gay rights were becoming a prominent issue in america and so it, that we're going to continue to paint this picture because it's very important that like you fought for your rights mm-hmm. right like now the world finally says okay fine whatever you can fuck who you want to fuck and and in a lot of cities will even let you live with your partner fine you don't get any other benefits you don't get any other rights but we're at least going to stop arresting you for being gay right and that's a big triumph in that time that's you know more than you ever had exactly you didn't think you would ever get that and now you have it and now it's kind of like this celebration like we worked really hard and we rioted and we fought and and we're good Mm mm-hmm so prominent were gay activists in certain cities that public officials dared not make a move without queer consent. This was especially true in the gay meccas of New York City and San Francisco, which consequently would also evolve into the epicenters of the AIDS crisis in America. In his book, And the Band Played On, Schultz offers these cities as a direct contrast to one another, both in their approach to LGBTQ plus rights and in their approach to the epidemic. Though New York had been the place of Stonewall, it was not the leader of gay freedom that many believed. Most New York gays enjoyed their liberties, power, and parties in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, only traveling to places like Greenwich Village when they wanted a night out in the gay bars. And even then, by the late 70s, there were plenty of so-called respectable gay joints in wealthier parts of town. The wider needs of poor queer residents were left behind as white gays enjoyed the new freedom to have sex without fear fear of arrest. Fire Island was a hotbed of white male gay privilege where most summer residents cared more about how many conquests they could have than how many legal rights they could obtain. And sadly, it was their own privilege and lack of concern that would keep them exposed and vulnerable to the disease for so much longer. On the other side of the country, San Francisco had evolved into a gay utopia as much as was possible during that era. The city had a long history in the queer revolution, birthing pre-Stonewall unrest and civil disobedience. It was in San Francisco that the New Year's Eve raid of 65 happened, later called the Stonewall of San Francisco, and where the Compton Cafeteria riots took place, which was a uh, transgender uprising, as well as the White Knight riots a decade, la- a decade later after the passing of a lenient sentence on a Harvey Milk assassinator, Dan White. But it was, actually, it was exactly this history of rebellion that brought about a social and political conscience in the LGBTQ plus community. 
Whereas many queer people across the country held little hope of having any type of political clout, in, Fran in San Francisco, the gays ruled the day. This was a city where the first openly gay candidate, Jose Saria, Saria, I'm not going to say it right, but I'm trying, had run for city council in 1961, and it was the city that had finally elected the first openly gay official in 1977 when Harvey Milk was voted onto the Board of Supervisors. As a whole, San Fran was one of the few cities in the country that not only extended a few gay rights to its citizen, citizens, but also lent open support to the community. And that was more than one could find in, the, in most other locations across the nation or even around the world. So I, the thing about these two cities, so like get like New York really was it was it was the privileged gays mm -hmm. that had like like yeah they're credited with Stonewall but they weren't really the revolutionaries that people thought. I mean you had the poor queers that were, but the privileged gays were like I can fuck who I want. That's all I care about. Yep. In San Francisco, you had a political movement where people are like, we're going to change how things are. We're going to get gay people elected. We're going to change the laws. And it was very opposite and very different. And it mattered because when the crisis broke out, these two places responded very differently. Yep. And that had a ripple effect. However, even in the politically minded San Francisco, most queer people, especially most white queer people, believed that this was as good as it got. They had fought hard for the right to live with their partners, to be open about their sexuality in their spaces, and to sleep with whoever they wanted. And while the rest of the world might not be on board, in places like New York, Miami, San Francisco, Chicago, and a few other major cities, many gays and lesbians did have these rights. Things were not perfect. In fact, they were still especially difficult for black and brown queer people, as well as trans and gender nonconforming individuals. But as the 70s wound down, many gays and lesbians seemed to want to take a break and simply bask in the rights that they had earned. Bathhouses peaked in their sexual activity, and many gay bars often became glorified fuck rooms after a certain hour of the night. Drugs and poppers ran wild, and the bath and bathhouses couldn't keep the cans of Crisco stocked fast enough. Con they talked a lot about Crisco and the oh, band played on. Jesus. Um, condoms were a joke, and lube was only for those who had a medical condition. There was certainly judgment for many, even some in the gay community, who were labeled as prudes. But it's also important to remember that sexual rights were all gays had at this time. Even in progressive cities like New York and San Francisco, LGBTQ people could still legally be fired, evicted, denied health benefits, and of course, they had no rights to all the legal benefits that came with marriage. All they were legally allowed to do was have sex, and so they did. And also, it's that thing of... This, like that being all you can do on top of the fact that for so long you had to hide who you were and you couldn't be who you were. Mm -hmm. You were like, fuck it, I'm free. I'm going to do everything I ever wanted to do for all those years where I didn't get to do anything. Yeah, exactly. And then you think about these people that run away from really um, homophobic places. And as we get closer to the 80s, the homophobia ramps up because we see that that right wing conservative swing that's coming so people escape to these cities and they're repressed and now there's like to them there's all the freedoms in the world in these cities mm -hmm. and the freedoms are all sex but they're like fuck it i'll do it's more sex. than i ever got to do before everybody else is doing it yeah exactly and so there was a and in these cities it was a very much promoted like it was like this is what you were made for. You were made for sex. And you were kind of treated that way, right? Mm -hmm. Because the rest of society just looked at you based on who you had sex with. Right. And that's so, all it was. Either you have sex with men or you have sex with women only. Mm -hmm. Like that's like, that's who you are. That's you as a person. You yeah. are a deviant. This is what you want. And so then people embrace that and mm -hmm. they become even more deviant. And I don't mean that in a, a derogatory way, but they were like, you want to see deviancy? Right. We'll show you deviancy. And so these bathhouses would have like 800 people at a night. You'd have massive orgy rooms. You'd have your leather shops going. You'd have everything. And like, I mean, and people were just being as debauched as they could to be like, fine. It was like a, re um, a resistance. It was a fighting. It was like a way to fight back. It was. It was exactly a way to fight back and be like, fuck you. And you're not going to tell us what to do anymore because we can fuck whoever we want as much as we want. Mm -hmm. And that's that. And then you can also see the why um, sexual uh, education is so important because yep. because there's such a lack of it, because nobody wants to talk about sex, because nobody wants to teach safety, it directly led to all of these issues. Ex that's exactly what happened. And then any person in the gay community that, that was like, listen, though, we've got to have safe sex. They were shut down. They were told that they were, uh, you know, they had internalized homophobia. Any mm -hmm. person that uh, that even advocated for monogamy was like, you can get the fuck out of here. How dare you disrespect us in our community? This is who we are. Mm -hmm. 
And so all just a conglomerate between the conservative right wing and AIDS and then the um, resistance of the gay people all came together to make it just a clusterfuck. Yep. Literally. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Throughout 1978 and 79, men began to arrive in clinics with mysterious illnesses that made no sense. A perfectly healthy man in his late 20s or early 30s seemed to deteriorate overnight as one rare disease after another ravaged his body. It seemed that as soon as one illness was cured or treated, another would take its place. At the time, the cases were few and spread out across the country, so doctors were not aware that several of their peers were experiencing the same baffling cases. Remember that these were the days before the internet and people couldn't con couldn't connect via message boards or a medical forum the way that they can today. The only way to track these cases was through the official submission of cases to the medical group or to the CDC. And this was only done when a doctor suspected a disease might become widespread. A new decade done in 1980. Ronald Reagan became president, and America swung hard to the conservative right. Um, I just want to make my correction. He was elected president. He didn't take office till 1981, because I know that's going to come back to get me. Go ahead. <laughs> Doctors in major cities were beginning to wor worry as they started to see bizarre cases of rare illnesses more frequently. The most common diagnosis was Kaposi's sarcoma. Kaposi's, yeah, it's Kaposi's sarcoma. Okay, yes, <laughs> which in itself was a very rare form of cancer and almost unheard of in the demographic suddenly coming down with the disease. KS first originated in the Mediterranean a century before, and while it had made its way to around, while it had made its way around the globe, less than 800 cases had been reported in the previous 100 years. And what was more bizarre was that while almost all of those cases were reported in elderly Italian and Jewish men in poor health, the men being diagnosed now were all young and unhealthy young and healthy. It just didn't make sense that a disease that had laid dormant for so long would suddenly take off and in such a dramatic turn from its previous trend. So yeah, we'll have some words because I try to stick with what they knew at the time. So most people were diagnosed with Kaposi's sarcoma or with the form of pneumonia that I still can't pronounce, but it's in here. And, and it's really weird when you're like, this is a disease that only happens in Jewish men who are 70. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you have this just young guy in his 30s getting sick. But that the again, uh, if you don't understand AIDS, it's a you know it breaks down your immune system. So it's not AIDS that kill you; it's the fact that it robs your immune system, and right. then anything else can kill you. Even a common cold, anything that could just come and make you any type of sick. Which is why it was so hard for them to understand what was going on because mm -hmm. these people were getting different illnesses and they were dying, but it didn't make sense why they were getting right. illnesses. And it was also hard to track. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Yeah, true. Yet the signs were all there. Patients with Kaposi's sarcoma developed purple la lesions slowly across their body. Lesions, lesions, I always hear it. Lesions. Lesions. Developed purple lesions slowly across their body. The lesions themselves were painless, and while the cancer did weaken the body, usually the victim died of other causes. However, these young men were deteriorating overnight, and it made no sense. Dr. Linda Labenstein of New York City met her first patient in 1979, Rick Welikoff. She thought the diagnosis was a fluke, or possibly a misdiagnosis for the time. Yet, just a few weeks later, a colleague at the VA hospital in NYC called her up to tell her that he, too, had a diagnosis. It seemed a bizarre coincidence that both victims were young men and both identified as gay. Across the country, in San Francisco, Dr. Selma Dritz was concerned about the growing cases of gastrointestinal disease among queer people. She had spent the previous decade working to combat the hepatitis wave that had hit the city's LGBTQ community, and now there seemed to be another bug getting a bug getting everyone inf and now there seemed to be another bug getting everyone infected. Dr. Dritz was a strong ally to the queer community, even, lo even lovingly referred to as the den mother of the gays by her children. Her devotion to the LGBTQ had made her one of the foremost experts on gay health, yet the doctor was exhausted by the community's refusal to engage in safe sex. Dritz ran a VD clinic in the heart of San Francisco, and VD stands for venereal disease, which is an outdated term for STD or STI, which is STI is the most proper term. Of the 70,000 patients they saw each year, 80% identified as gay. 
The fact that most sexually transmitted illnesses now had treatment available made the increase in STIs even more frequent. Young men would come in, get their medication, and before the treatment was even finished, they would be back in the bathhouses. In general, the lack of sex education was a widespread problem across all demographics in the U.S., but in major cities where sex was more readily available, STIs found a haven. And while it was frustrating to have our advice fall on deaf ears, that it wasn't why Selma Dritz was so concerned in the fall of 1980. And um, also, like, sex education really wasn't much of a thing. But it really wasn't a thing in the gay communities. Right. There was no, nobody wanted to talk about that. That was dirty. You know, oh, yeah. Know. She, like, you so, avoid that. Exactly. And Selma Dritz would talk about that. Like, she would talk about rimming. She would talk about, and but when she would say these things, other health professionals would look at her like, what the fuck are you saying? Mm-hmm. Like, what do, what do you mean men eat ass? Are you kidding me? And so she couldn't talk about why so many men had gastro, gastro, blah, gastro issues because people didn't even want to hear her talk about why they had it, let mm-hmm. alone how they could prevent it. Right. The doctor worried about the consequences of what would happen if something that couldn't be treated suddenly found its way to San Francisco. Addressing a group of colleagues in October of that year, she warned, too much is being transmitted. We've got all these diseases going unchecked. There are so many opportunities for transmission that if something new gets loose here, we're going to have hell to pay. But Dr. Dritz was seen as an alarmist who just didn't understand that the gays would always be this way. They're sexual creatures. That's all they're on this earth to do. Exactly. They're like, that's what they want to do. In November of 1980, a gay man named Ken Horn visited Dr. Jim Groundwater to ask about the purple spots developing on his thigh and right nipple. Groundwater noticed that Horn's limp nodes were swollen and heard the man tell of how he had experienced one illness after another. The doctor then ran some tests and noticed that there was something wrong with Ken's white blood cells. He ran more tests, picking and poking Ken, and found that the patient's immune system wasn't responding. It was a baffling scenario the doctor had never before witnessed, so he sent the blood out for tests. Imagine being that patient. Oh, Ken Horn was very mad. Where you're just like, I have no idea what's going on with you. I am literally just have to do test after test after test. We're going to try this. Like, nobody knows what's wrong with you. Like, the fear, the pain, like the... Well, that's the anger. Exactly. Well, yeah, like I said, Ken Horn was very mad. I, I mean, I didn't put enough in here about him, but like he was he was just a, uh, an experiment the last like three mm-hmm. years of his life. Just like one test right. after another. And he would be like, no, you're not running another test until you tell me what's wrong with me. And they would just have to be like, but we don't know what's wrong with you. We right. can't figure it out. Ugh. On December 23rd, 1980, Dr. Lobenstein's patient, Rick Welikoff, passed away in New York City with his partner by his side. Across the country, several other heartbroken lovers and friends mourned their, fir- mourned their first Christmas without their loved ones who had died of mysterious causes. Some doctors were beginning to whisper that there was a new disease going around in homosexual men, yet the concept made no sense to the medical professionals. Illness is no respecter of persons. How is it then that so many of their queer patients were suddenly getting ill with the same set of symptoms? Purple lesions and swollen lymph nodes, followed by a uh, breakdown in the immune system and finally shortness and slow shortness and slow shortness ag- of breath oh. Sorry. and finally shortness of breath and slow agonizing death more importantly why couldn't they figure out how to help their patients and you know in this time with reagan being in office mm-hmm. and such a rise in the um religious right that it was this is jesus you're getting you're all being punished for being Homosexual oh, yeah. sodomites. This is what the Bible warned you of. You're, you know. Well, they're getting know. there. It's not yet. At you this know it's po- coming now. Oh yeah, yeah, it's coming. It's coming hard. But um, at this point, nobody knows about it. Like mm-hmm. nobody knows. At best, some doctors know. Like, hey, they they don't know. Their patients are all have different causes of death, but they all have the same symptoms. Like right. they get the swollen lymph nodes. They die this like really awful slow death. And so they're kind of talking to figure it out. But that's it. The doctors know. And a couple of gay people start waking up and being like, your friend died. And I heard Bob over here died. And they're like, that's weird. But they they can't put it together yet. Mm -hmm. On February 1st, 1981, CDC technician Sandy Ford received an order for pentamidine. 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 That's what I think it is. Pentamidine. Like iodine. Maybe. Pentamidine? I don't know. It was a rare controlled drug used to treat a rare form of pneumonia known as pneumocystis. Pneumocystis. 
pneumon- pneumon- it's a kind of pneumonia. Yeah. <laughs> Typically, children with leukemia caught this pneumonia while they were battling cancer, cancer, or occasionally adults being treated with chemo may, may come down with the bug. Because of its rarity, Sandy Ford was the only person in the country who filled orders for the medication. Doctors always put a reason they needed the medicine, but on this order, the doctor had left the field blank. This annoyed Sandy, who made a mental note to yet filled the order anyways. Wow, I've stumbled through that. He made it. Yeah. A month later, Sandy received another order of pentamidine for, from the same doctor. Again, there was no explanation, and she huffed as she filled his request. By April, Sandy Ford was calling the doctor herself, wondering why in the hell he needed five orders of pentamidine in the last eight weeks. The doctor told her he had not one, but two cases of the rare pneumonia. At the time, Ford thought the doctor was just incompetent. On April 24th, Dr. Jim Groundwater called the CDC about his patient, Ken Horn, Ken Horn, making him the first reported patient of the unfolding epidemic. However, no one at the CDC was interested in Horn's case, and the conversation was never recorded. Yet Sandy Ford was receiving more orders from the other doctors and decided to draw up a memo. On April 28, 1981, technician Sandy Ford officially alerted the CDC to the possibility of a new disease. Good old Sandy Ford. On June 5, 1981, the CDC Monthly published a summarized report by Dr. Michael Gottlieb of Los Angeles. Gottlieb had been trying to get his report on pneumo cystis to pneumonia and homosexual men los angeles published in the new england journal of medicine but the journal had told the doctor it would be six months at least before they could publish the article and there was no guarantee it would pass the peer-reviewed test so gottlieb went with a, the next best thing and had his report published in the cdc monthly the cdc took out the title's part about homosexual men and simply retitled it pneumocystis pneumonia los angeles Still, there was a very important sentence in that report that would later determine the reactions and treatment of the disease. It read, The fact that these patients were all homosexuals suggests an association between some aspect of homosexual lifestyle or disease acquired through sexual contact and the pneumonia and this population. The implications of the study swept through the medical field and the LGBT community while most others ignored the small report. Some gay doctors were outraged, knowing the future stigma this would place on the gay community, and they weren't wrong. Within weeks, the new cases of Kaposi's sarcoma and pneumocytosis pneumonia were being labeled the gay cancer. But worse, the study inadvertently deflected attention from several other non-homosexual cases that had started to spring up in around in and around large cities. Dr. Mary Gwynnon reported several cases in drug users in New York City, but her reports were dismissed as not being related to gay cancer. Not only that, but many in the Haitian immigrant community were showing similar symptoms, but again, were dismissed as unrelated. And when you're getting, like, imagine this big epidemic going around as the gay cancer, Mm -hmm. and gay still is, but especially at that time was such a stigma. Yeah. And you are a straight person who contracts this gay disease can you tell anybody is your family going to disown you because they're going to assume you're a deviant and Mm -hmm. it just blows up bingo yeah and that's exactly it like there was again this is all comes in the second half but it's like the thing where people started asking doctors not to put it on their death certificate, mm-hmm. um, which it didn't even have an official name at this point. But like later on, whenever AIDS did have a name and people would be like, well, don't put AIDS on there. Put cancer, put something else. Right. I don't care what it is. Um, anything but that. Anything but that. But that's what's so infuriating is that like as soon as cases are detected in homosexuals, almost right away, you also see cases detected in heterosexuals mm-hmm. right away. But that's but they refuse to believe it for years. You will see they will not any person who has the symptoms of AIDS, but, but they're not gay. They're like, well, sorry, you couldn't you couldn't possibly have AIDS because you're not gay. Right. Even though the medical science is there, the doctors are like, are you fucking kidding me? This is the same thing. And they're like, nope, sorry, not gay. Can't do it. No. Right. Straight. Yeah. And, and that's why so many and that and that's why it continued to spread because and that's why it's still a widespread problem today. Exactly, because straight people today still believe that they cannot get AIDS, mm-hmm. and it's baffling because there's actually more women with AIDS in the world than there are men. 
but we it's constantly a gay male disease. Mm-hmm. That's how it's portrayed. All right, go ahead. Even with strictly homosexual cases reported, within four weeks of the CDC report, 108 cases were phoned in and 43 of the subjects were already dead. The news startled a few in the gay community who had already lost someone to the mysterious illness. Some men, such as Larry Kramer and Paul Pomfin in New York and Bill Cross in San Francisco, began to speak out about the disease. But they were overwhelmingly drowned out by the rest of the queer community. Most were afraid that if a gay disease were true and if it did spread through sex, that the few liberties queers had earned would suddenly evaporate. Many even stood convinced that if... that it would be just a matter of time before the Reagan administration rounded all the homos up and locked them in camps. It had been less than 40 years since Hitler's concentration camps, which had held gay prisoners stamped with a pink triangle. The memory was fresh and terrifying. I didn't even think about that connection, like living during that time and having witnessed that, or at least having parents who firsthand witnessed that. Oh, yeah. You know, or like your uncle was locked up because he was gay. Exactly. Like, In his book, Randy Schultz's outrage towards the debauchery of the gay community at the Times seeps through. But even though his book was published just seven years after the initial outbreak, he still had the hindsight that time grants. It's easy to pass judgment It's easy to pass judgment on what the queer community should have done when we can clearly see the picture. But in a time where a gay man could be murdered just by leaving the city limits of San Francisco and New York, it's easy to see that the LGBT community had a hard time knowing who to believe, especially since many gay doctors and health officials were playing down the disease for fear of stigma and bias. Yeah, so like, he's like so self-righteous in his book and... I, I get it. The guy spent seven years reporting on the disease. He knew better than anyone what was happening. Mm-hmm. But it's just, it's so easy to be like, you should have seen it. But right. you couldn't really, like, you don't trust the government. And the government's, and like your own doctors are telling you, it's fine. Don't right. worry about it. And so you're like, yeah, I'm not going to worry about it. Why would I believe this random guy and not my doctor? Exactly. And as a whole, most people in the country ignored gay cancer completely. So life went on as usual for queer life. The bathhouses of the gas of the Castro district gathered around 3,000 patrons a week, with weekends attracting as many as 800 men in one bath. Fire Island filled up that summer as it had every year with the wealthiest and prettiest of queer patrons. When a few men went around collecting money for gay cancer research, they raised a menial $6,635 from the country's elite gay men, and a good chunk of those funds came from the organizers themselves. For his part, Jim Curran of C- Curran? Curran, I think. of CDC headquarters in Atlanta was doing his best to track down the origins of the disease in order to know how to warn the public. A difficult job considering the CDC budget had already been heavily slashed by the Reagan administration. Once again, history showed a president who didn't have the foresight to consider the impacts of a national epidemic and un- and an underfunded disease control department. Wonder when that mm, recently well, when, when does that That's, happen? Hmm, strange. Republicans both times. <laughs> Despite his limited budget, Curran traveled to cities where major outbreaks were happening and visited the bars and bathhouses. For a while, many suspected the cancer was triggered by a new chemical in poppers. CDC agents were sent to discreetly round up various brands of the popular drug and bring them back for testing. The popper theory was quickly put to rest by researchers, yet the theory floated around for years and was used to justify ignoring safe sex. People would rather drop the poppers than put a condom on. And is that why poppers are illegal to sell? Is that like related to that? Um, and I, not that I found. Oh. I have no idea. But um, I, yeah, they did test a lot of poppers and realized it wasn't them. Maybe it was done later on to like deter people from having sex. I don't know. Hmm. But and, and again, remember, at this point, they don't even know how it spreads. They don't know that it's like some people are speculating it could be sexually transmitted because that's the only thing that would make sense. Like it's not a it can't be a homosexual disease. Like any right. doctor who is rational knew it can't be a homosexual disease. So what is the homosexual doing community doing that could make this make disease spread? Rampant. Exactly. But nobody knew yet that it was sexually transmitted. Mm-hmm. On November 30th, 1981, Ken Horn, the first patient reported to the CDC, passed away from a disease that still did not have an official name. By now, a few gay newspapers were discussing the disease, and occasionally a national newspaper would pick up an article and bury it in the back pages. As a whole, all media, gay or straight, referred to the disease as the gay plague or the gay cancer. In December, Dr. Jakas Leibovich read the CDC report by Dr. Gottlieb and realized that some of the cases he had seen in Paris matched Dr. Gottlieb's report. 
though he found the fact that the disease was classified as a gay disease very odd. Randy Schultz wrote Leibowitz's experience as such. How very American, he thought, <laughs> to look at a disease as homosexual or heterosexual, as if the virus had, as if viruses had the intelligence to choose between different inclinations of human behavior. Those Americans were simply obsessed with sex. The same month in Bronx, New York, Dr. Ari Rubenstein began to draft his report on five black infants that had the same symptoms reported in what the media labeled the gay plague. In his opinion, this proved that the gay plague had nothing to do with being gay at all. Here he had five newborns who had contracted the disease in their mother's womb. He knew that three of the mothers were drug users, which pointed to the fact that the disease could spread through blood. Something much more deadly and dangerous was at play, and the stigma of gay cancer was hindering real medical progress. Rubenstein submitted his proposal to present the findings at a conference for the American Academy of Pediatrics. But he was shot down and quietly derided in the community as having lost his mind. After all, babies couldn't get gay cancer. Everyone knew that. <laughs> Every time someone was like, but I've got this person here that has it. Nope, sorry. Nope, they're not a gay man. <laughs> not possible. The darker truth was that if doctors and researchers kept this a gay cancer, then it would be acceptable for them to drag their feet on finding proper treatment. If this was just a disease for the queers, then they could justifiably turn away gay patients and disregard their pleas for help. For their part, more people were beginning to mobilize in queer communities, though it was still a slim minority. Bobby Campbell in San Francisco was the first person to come out as openly having gay cancer and became a poster boy for the movement. In New York, Larry Kramer wrote scathing articles to his queer siblings on the dangers of unprotected and frequent sex with strangers, but he's dismissed as an alarmist and homophobe, said writer, said writer Robert Chelsea. I think the concealed meaning of Kramer's emotionalism is the triumph of guilt, that gay men deserve to die for their promiscuity. I am not downplaying the seriousness of Kaposi's sarcoma but something else is happening here which is also serious gay homophobia and anti-eroticism kramer responded i'm not glorying in death i am overwhelmed by it the death of my friends the death of whatever community there is here in new york the death of any visible love um and if you don't know larry kramer passed away several weeks ago uh, actually by the time this drops he'll have passed away about a month ago um, but he was one of the few gay men at the time that stood up and said, we've got to take this serious. We've got to start practicing safe sex. But he was also already kind of an outcast because he had written a book called Faggots, yeah. which talked about very negatively about how um, sexually promiscuous the gay community was. So he was already, people were already like, fuck you, Larry, for judging us. And then this happened, and the last people want, the last thing people wanted to do was give him any kind of reason to think he was yeah, right. this guy was coming against us. Why would we ever, like, fuck him? I yeah. can totally see that. Yeah, exactly. Um, the deaths were starting to become overwhelming. Two cases of gay cancer were being diagnosed every week in New York City alone. So far, groups in NYC had raised less than $12,000 for research, and the government and states seemed completely uninterested in, growing, in the growing disease. Newspapers were killing most stories because they saw that the very topic of gay cancer and gay cancer from gay sex, no less, was incredibly distasteful. In 1981, one major news show, Good Morning America, gave the budding epidemic any airtime. CDC Director Jim Curran was given 150 seconds to address the disease. At the end of the year, 152 official cases were reported in 15 states, but those numbers weren't even close to being accurate. By January of 1982, gay cancer was giving us, given a slightly more official name through the term GRID, Gay-Related Immune Deficiency. While the acronym certainly sounded better than gay plague, it still ignored the glaring truth that this was not a gay disease. Doctors in impoverished areas were seeing high spikes in the disease among people of all orientations, genders, and ages. As is often common, the lack of resources combined with institutionalized racism allowed for higher rates of GRID among black and brown communities. People who were showing the most signs of the disease were Haitian immigrants, sex workers, drug users, and gay men. The early AIDS epidemic is often painted as a white gay crisis. The truth is, it was deliberately portrayed this way partly as a homophobic attack on the queer community and partly out of complete apathy for blacks, drug users, and sex workers. 
By showcasing AIDS as a gay disease, not only could the media, the government, and LGBTQ opponents fan the fires of hate, but they could also blatantly ignore as other undesirables silently wasted away. And it wasn't for a lack of knowledge. Cases of GRID in Haitians in Miami can be tracked and report had been tracked and reported to the CDC since 1981. However, officials refused to believe the black men were not gay and assumed the black women were prostitutes. Of course. So, like, what, like they would report it and they would say, "Okay, we've got a case here," and the man they'd say, "But, but the man says that he's uh, he's heterosexual," and they'd be like, "Yeah, I'm sure he's heterosexual." Mm-hmm. So, like, you just they re- right, and then yeah, yeah. But that also, like, it's kind of like, I don't want to use the word genocide because that's not right. Eh, But the willingness to say, hey, that's all the other people that Mm -hmm. we don't like. Yep. So if we just ignore this and they die out, that's, they have less votes. There's less of them around. They have less lives. And there's less of them uh, for us good, outstanding, rich, white people yeah. Good, white, outstanding Christian people mm-hmm. to have to worry about. And we're just cleaning up the streets. Yeah. I, that was literally the attitude of the Reagan administration. Mm-hmm. We're just going to ignore it. We're going to let them die. And honestly, if Rock Hudson hadn't died of AIDS, I really wonder if Reagan would have ever said a goddamn word. Who knows? Who knows? Because it wasn't until he died and all of Hollywood got mad that Reagan was like, all right, all right. I guess we can do something now. <laughs> In San Francisco, Dr. Selma Dritz was overwhelmed. She was the first doctor to officially begin tracking the disease, and now she saw there were 150 cases of grid in New York City alone. And San Francisco was on a projected track to mirror New York City within a year. Dritz was also one of the first people to recognize and adamantly insist that grid was a sexually transmitted disease. Now she also understood it could. Now she understood it could also be transmitted through blood. Yet, no matter how loud she and other doctors, such as respected physician Mark Conant, Canant, Canant yelled about the dangers of unsafe sex. The community refused to listen, and the local government refused to intervene or educate the public. In July of 1970, 1982, I put 72, doctors, researchers, and medical officials gathered to discuss the disease that would not be ignored. Already, there were studies proving that GRID could be transmitted through blood, though blood banks refused to acknowledge this fact which would mean they would have to screen their blood donors. And worse, it meant that they most certain that they most certainly had infected someone with the disease through a blood transfusion. But even though blood banks denied the truth, most officials at least agreed it was no longer a gay cancer. The disease needed a more fitting and encompassing name, and after much debate, they settled on the term AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Aside from establishing an, a uniform term for the new disease, 1982 saw little progress around the AIDS crisis as infected rates climb, infection rates climbed. Funding was a nightmare backed by a lying government that talked out the side of its mouth. Official decla- officials declared that AIDS was their number one priority, claiming that more than $2 million was dedicated to the disease. While $2 million directly given to AIDS treatment and research would already have been woefully short, the truth is that $2 million was given to departments that researched all cancers and could also study AIDS. At best, many doctors working directly with AIDS patients received about 100000 in federal funding for the year, which is enough to cover a doctor's salary, one nurse, and a few basic supplies. Yeah, so they would do this thing, and they did this for years, where they would be like, look, we've donated... We've given, we, we put $30 million towards AIDS research this year. Mm-hmm. But then when you broke it down, it would be a couple million that was actually going to places that studied uh, AIDS. And then when you spread it out across the country, like I said, you'd be lucky to get $100,000. Right. And you, what are you going to do with fucking $100,000 after you paid your salary and an assistant? You can't even treat the patient. Right. Like you can't do any studies. You can't do anything else. Mm-hmm. Another development of 1982 was the launch of the Gay Men's Health Crisis in New York. The organization focused on social work, helping AIDS patients find a hospital that would treat them, helping them find apartments that would accept them, since most landlords stopped renting to AIDS patients, and the Gay Men's Health Crisis also provided support groups, ran a hotline, and offered resources to anyone who wanted them. However, they faced many obstacles just in getting the word out. 
For instance, they had to be careful about putting their organization name on the front of any material because just by carrying a pamphlet or a postcard with the words gay, a person could be outed. Some of the biggest fights in the organization erupted over this very issue. While Larry Kramer, a founder and board member, believed it was important for the organization to be open, GMHC President Paul Pompin believed the opposite. Eventually, Larry would be fired from the board for being too outspoken against the bathhouses and unprotected sex. One final moment of 1982 really showed the contrast between the lack of concern and funding around AIDS and what was considered more general population health concerns, a.k.a heterosexual public health. In October, the city of Chicago experienced a scare when someone tampered with Tylenol packages and poured cyanide into the capsules. The federal government sent 1,100 people to test Tylenol capsules. Johnson & Johnson spent $100 million alone in addition to immense state and federal um, state and federal funding. Within five weeks, lawmakers had passed regulations that enforced tamper-resistant packaging. The New York Times published 54 pieces on the subject. Seven people died of the capsules. Conversely, 634 Americans had been diagnosed with AIDS and 260 were dead, but there was no funding, no rush for regulations and testing, no media buzz, only silence. It really and that's how it goes. It, yeah. It really puts it in perspective. Seven mm -hmm. people died and you got all of that change and millions, hundreds of millions and, and in no time, like right away. Five weeks. Mm -hmm. Five weeks you got all that done. And here we are, uh, three years, two years since the first thing's been reported to the CDC, but three years since cases started popping up and nothing. Mm -hmm. On December 9th, Mayor Diane Feinstein approached the podium of the city hall to make her announcement. She was vetoing the domestic partners ordinance, which would have legally given queer couples the right to file a civil union and collect the same benefits as married heterosexual couples. On a personal level, Feinstein began, this legislation causes me deep personal anguish. I would like to be able to sign legislation that recognizes the needs of single persons, but such legislation must not divide our community. The news devastated the San Francisco LGBTQ community. Once again, their relationships were reduced to nothing more than sex. With the visto, with the veto, Feinstein might as well have said, fuck your brains out, just don't think about just don't think your love is legitimate that night the bathhouses were flooded as patrons rejected once again threw themselves with abandon into the one solace that they were allowed in two months the national aids cases had risen from 634 to 900 and with that we will return next week with the second half of the aids crisis in the 1980s your recommended resources this week your recommended resource this week is And the Bad and Played On by Randy Schiltz. You can also watch the movie based on the book for free on YouTube right now, though this may be a temporary feature. YouTube also allows you to rent the two hour long movie if you don't have the chance to watch it for free. And if you haven't had any and if you haven't bought any Pride merch, this is probably your last chance to get some before the end of Pride Month. However, Pride colors are never out of style, so feel free to check out our merch shop. 365 days a year. And remember, join us in promoting the podcast the last two weeks of Pride and to celebrate our two-year anniversary. We would appreciate it if you just share the podcast, share your favorite episode, share a bit about the podcast, share a link, anything. Just share, help us share and promote the podcast. And like I said, we'll, we appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And um, we have received a lot of messages from people saying how much our podcast has helped them. So... While we are asking you to share the podcast so that we can get more listeners, by us getting more listeners, that allows us to help more people. Exactly. And don't forget, you can join us for our Friday support group. Um, it meets at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but it's all across all time zones. So if you want to join, you just have to email yourqueerstory at gmail.com, yourqueerstory at gmail. Uh, send a request. We do a, a light screening just to make sure we don't have any trolls in the group. And then you can join our support group. Um, it's a video conferencing. And so it's been very helpful to some people. It's going well. So again, um, the more you share our podcasts, you're not just sharing good information about queer history and queer issues, but you are helping us provide resources to other people. Yeah. So stay queer. Don't get a lobotomy. We love our little allied hookers. And a little succulent sapphists. We're bis who? Jesus, resist the oppressors, our proud homocrats. And have yourself a sodomy riot. Or don't. And black lives matter. Bye. Bye.